Welcome. My name is Julia Lamb. I'm an associate professor of theology here at Georgetown University. Thank you for coming to this inaugural lecture of the James M. and Margaret H. Coston Lecture in Early Christianity. This lectureship was established with three objectives in mind. <laughs> Is this better? Yeah, now I can hear myself. Okay. So, thank you for coming to this inaugural lecture of the James M. and Margaret H. Coston Lecture in Early Christianity. This lectureship was established with three objectives in mind. First and foremost, to honor leading scholars of early Christianity and to celebrate their contribution to the field. Second, to fund an annual public lecture on early Christianity that would bring together the academy, the general public, and church communities. And third, to support both the study and the teaching of early Christian literature, history, and practice. On behalf of the university, Georgetown College, and the Department of Theology, I want to thank Jay and Margaret Coston for this amazing gift to Georgetown. Thank you. We are, of course, so honored to have Peter Brown give the inaugural lecture. It is his reputation that has drawn all of you here to fill up this auditorium. Before Brian Daly gives a more formal introduction to Professor Brown, I would like to take just a moment to relate a more personal background story. As an undergraduate, Margaret had studied religion at Stanford University, and she then went on to read theology at Oxford, where she listened with great appreciation and admiration to the lectures of Peter Brown. As it turns out, her time there coincided with his last two years at Oxford. And so, in a sense, the story has come full circle. Now we shall all, together with Margaret and Jay, have the pleasure of listening to Peter Brown speak, this time on alms, work, and the holy poor, early Christian monasticism between Syria and Egypt. This evening, we are, in fact, doubly honored because we have we will have at the podium two eminent scholars of early Christianity. Brian Daly of the Society of Jesus is a Catherine Huskin Professor of Theology at the University of Notre Dame. He has received BAs from Fordham University and from the University of Oxford, an MA from Oxford, a Licentiate in Philosophy from Loyola Seminary in New York, a Licentiate in Theology from Sankt Georgen in Frankfurt, and a DPhil from the University of Oxford. Professor Daly is a historical theologian specializing in the development of Christian doctrine between the 4th and the 8th centuries. Among his many publications are The Hope of the Early Church and Gregory of Nazianzus. In 2002, he delivered the Darcy Lectures in the University of Oxford, entitled God Visible, Patristic Christology Reconsidered. He is currently enjoying a research stay here at Georgetown, where I understand he has revised those lectures into a book that will be forthcoming. Um, so please join me in welcoming Professor Brian Daly, SJ. Thank you so much, Julia, and thank you all I'm really thrilled to be here. This is a great honor, especially for someone who's just a visiting fireman here at Georgetown this semester. Um, I have a long friendship with Georgetown, but I haven't been a part of the, the faculty or the university administration. It's a, a special delight and an honor for me to be able to present to you our lecturer tonight, Peter Brown. I'd love to be able to say that we're old friends, but that would probably be slightly inaccurate. I, I think it'd be more accurate to say that Peter Brown is one of my long-term heroes and someone whom I've really admired as a model and as an inspiration for most of my life, certainly all of my life as a scholar. I first heard him lecture, I think 51 years ago, which is an awful admission for any of us, <laughs> when 
I was studying at Merton College in Oxford doing a, a degree, a master's degree in classics and philosophy. Uh, and Professor Brown at that time was a young fellow of all souls in Oxford offering a series of lectures on St. Augustine and his culture. And I remember going to hear them even though Augustine was not part of my uh, syllabus for my finals because even then I was kind of hoping to be a patristic scholar when I grew up. And I must say that Peter Brown's lectures helped move me a lot further in that direction. Being a fellow of all souls, in a sense, as you may know, in England, is something like being a member of the Académie Française in, in France. You are an immortal. You are one of the scholars selected for this great distinction of being able simply to do research. He offered a series of lectures in a way as a kind of work of supererogation, I think, at that time, as a young scholar who simply wanted to do this to help focus his own ideas. And one of the innovations he had in that series of lectures in the fall of 1963, as I recall, was that he would hand out a, a mimeographed uh, sheet for each of them. He'd be lecturing on some aspect of Augustine and late antiquity. And instead of our having to copy down all the references to Augustine's works or to secondary literature, we had it all in hand as, as a sheet even before the proliferation of the Xerox machine. And I always remember at one point he had cited an article which was in Romanian. And so <laughs> he apologized in his charming way and said, well, this article is in Romanian, but if you don't read Romanian, there's a very convenient summary of it in Polish at the end. <laughs> I can't say I was consoled. <laughs> but I knew I was in the presence of a consummate professional. And when I came back to Oxford in 1972 to do my doctorate, Peter Brown was still there as a senior fellow at All Souls and still lecturing and I went again to a, a series of his lectures on late antiquity and found them, as always, incredibly interesting and stimulating. Since then, uh, he's continued to be enormously productive in his articles and a series of books that really have changed the landscape of what people know and think about late antiquity and Christianity. I can't name them all, or if I did, it would take us all evening. But his famous article on the holy man in late antiquity is certainly one that has become a kind of classic in our understanding of the role of religion in ancient society. His work on Augustine, of course, his biography of St. Augustine, which first appeared in 1967, I think, remains an indispensable classic if you want to study the life of that great thinker. The World of Late Antiquity, The Making of Late Antiquity were books that, that shaped a new term of thinking of the centuries after the classical Roman Empire. The Cult of the Saints, another series of lectures that he published as a book, has really gives, given us a sense of what holy people meant in the ancient world. His great book, The Body and Society, from 1988, was really about sexuality and desire in the ancient world. That, again, helped us to see things in a new way. And his new book, which came out just in 2012, Through the Eye of a Needle, is really a book that I think will, again, reshape the way we think about both the ancient world and the Christian tradition. It's about wealth and about how people in the Christian world in late antiquity thought of and used their wealth and were changed by it. How did Peter Brown change the landscape? To put it very briefly, I think you could say this, that since Edward Gibbon in the 18th century, many classicists tend to have a certain ideology, a certain outlook, which closes some of their uh, understanding of the role of Christianity in modern culture. The assumption has tended to be that ancient societies uh, declined from golden ages. The Greeks from a golden age about the fifth century before Christ, and the Romans, the Latins, perhaps from a golden age in the time of Caesar and Augustus, or if you want to stretch it, in the, in the first century of our own era, the time of Tacitus and Pliny. And the assumption is that 
both the language and the ideas, the culture, were in a state of steady decline after that until they really lapsed into darkness by the seventh or sixth century. The culprit in many people's eyes was Christianity. The introduction of this new rather foreign body which eventually became the accepted religious outlook of the empire east and west. And I think the assumption for many centuries, many generations at least, was that Christianity was one of the agents of corruption in ancient language and ancient thought and culture. Peter Brown, I think, has helped us through his own career to think differently, to look at Western society and culture not simply as in decline, but as also undergoing growth and vitality. And it's pointed out that the role of Christianity in the fourth and fifth and sixth centuries was in many ways to inject a new and vital element that enabled people to see the world in different ways, but in ways that were equally uh, important and, and fruitful for later generations. We have him to, th to thank, I think, for the whole concept of late antiquity as a time that is of enormous productivity and, and fruitfulness for the modern world. I've always loved listening to Peter Brown. I've always found his words and his style entrancing and engaging. Uh, and I'm happy to be able to present it to you tonight and hope that you share that same experience with me. It's, it's a great honor to be able to present to you Peter Brown, the Rollins Professor of History Emeritus at Princeton University. Um, Brian, thank you very much. I hardly recognize myself except the insufferable young Don. <laughs> um, Julia, Julia Lamb, thank you very much. I am deeply honored. And Margaret and James, Margaret and James Coston, thank you for what has already been splendid hospitality and now I hope will be a happy occasion, a small return for that hospitality. Um, it's, it's wonderful that you're going to have a course of lectures on early Christianity. This is something which cannot be done too often. It's like punching a hole in the wall punching a hole in the wall made for us by academic routines and by present day concerns to sort of catch through that precious gap of one hour something of the strange but familiar scent of a very ancient Christianity like the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. But only a century ago, few people would have approved of me of bringing the monks of Syria and Egypt to your attention. For until recently, we'd all tended to be the heirs of the great Edward Gibbon, the first volume of whose monumental history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire first appeared in 1776. And for him, he spoke with the sonorous and confident voice of the 18th century enlightenment. For him, monks were unpardonable. They were dropouts. They were fanatics. He wrote of them with ill-disguised contempt as those unhappy exiles from social life, impelled by the dark and implacable genius of superstition. Nowadays, our attitudes have changed. To put it very briefly, we now see the early monks who emerged in both Syria and in Egypt no longer as unhappy exiles from social life. We've come to see that 
Far from being weird and wonderful dropouts, the monks acted rather as the catalyst for the social imagination of an entire society. Like many other extremist movements in other ages, early Christian monasticism acted as a sort of social seismograph. We can trace, often in exaggerated form, like the rapid, abrupt, up-and-down movements of a modern seismograph, the more silent earth tremors of the normal Roman society from which the, nun, the monks bro broke free. Furthermore, we can see how those who supported the monks did so because they saw their own social dilemmas writ large, again, as in the dramatic high lines of a seismograph, in the persons of the monks. So what happened at this time was very much like what happened in the High Middle Ages when the extremist poverty of St. Francis and his followers arose as a comment on the boom and bust economy of the Italian cities of the 13th century, <clears throat> when nowadays the mission of St. Teresa in the slums of Calcutta focuses in dramatic personal form the anxieties of privileged nations in the face of the seemingly limitless poverty of much of the rest of the world. In the same way, from the 3rd to the 6th century AD, monks were very much part of the life of distinctive regions of what is now the Middle East and, and uh, Africa and it is to their seismographic quality that I'd like to draw attention this evening. At that time, these regions, Syria and Egypt in particular, formed the eastern provinces of a Roman Empire that was already half a millennial old. At a time when Gibbon describes the period of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire in the West in the 5th century AD, no such decline and fall was happening in the East. In the East, the Roman Empire was still alive and well. Seen from the East, the end of the Western Roman Empire in 476 was a non-event. This was because the eastern half of the empire was backed by a buoyant economy, a world which we now associate with dry deserts dotted with ancient ruins was thriving. It was the westernmost economic hub of a world system which reached across Eurasia along the Silk Road to the great cities of western China and which again reached down through Egypt and East Africa into the Indian Ocean. By comparison, our Western Europe, on which Gibbon lavished so much attention in tracing the awful revolution of the end of Roman rule in the West, was a peripheral and undeveloped region perched on the far tip of the Eurasian landmass. Last but not least, the discovery of ever-increasing numbers of papyri preserved in the dry sands of Egypt and the systematic searching of the libraries of the Christian churches of the modern Middle East that has revealed masses of unpublished material in Syriac, Coptic, and Ethiopic. These have now enabled us to look inside the communities of monks and of similar ascetics. We can follow their daily life, listen to their debates in a manner which Edward Gibbon perched among his books in London and in Lausanne on the shores of Lake Geneva, could never have done. 
Now, because of all this, we can enter into the minds of the monks on issues which were crucial for the nature of the society around them. And this is what I want to talk about this afternoon. I want to talk about a muffled debate on the nature of wealth, on labor, and on the care of the poor, which echoed throughout the monastic communities of the Mediterranean and the Middle East, from Mesopotamia, modern Iraq in the east, to southern Italy in the, in the west. Now, let me tell you why I've been led to this theme. In recent years, I've worked on the issues of wealth and the care of the poor in the Christian churches of late antiquity. I found myself increasingly asking who actually were the poor. And I realized somewhat to my surprise that in the Eastern Christian world of the later third and fourth centuries, there was as yet no simple answer to that question. Now my surprise deserves to be emphasized. We now tend to take for granted that the principal duty of good Christians in the disposal of their wealth has always been to show mercy to the real poor. We assume that this view already went without saying among the majority of Christians in around the year 300. It was from this definition of the poor, the real poor, that the ventures in charitable giving associated with all later Christianity b began. Yet, around the year 300, there were many Christian regions and many forms of Christianity where a rather different attitude was equally prominent. Many thought that Christians should give mainly to the holy poor, to the poor among the saints, to use the phrase of St. Paul's letter to the Romans, 15 verse 26, when describing his collection for the poor among the saints in the community of Jerusalem. These holy poor in the community claim to give the ethereal benefits of spiritual blessing, advice, and prayer in return for being entirely supported by the earthly offering of daily sustenance, as if they were utterly destitute, true beggars, indeed the only beggars who counted. And in the late and early 4th century, this division of opinion was particularly acute throughout a distinctive geographical area. Hence the latter part of my title, Between Egypt and Syria. <clears throat> now in order to understand why this was so, we have to place our conventional image of the rise of Christianity against a wider geographical background than we are accustomed to. We tend to think of Christianity as belonging largely to the Greco-Roman world, eventually to our own Western Europe as we now know it. But this is to ignore the success of Christianity in regions far to the east of Europe. These regions formed an extensive third world of Christianity. Its dominant languages were not Latin and Greek. They were Coptic, the ancient language of Egypt, and above all, 
Hyriac, the last and eventually the most widespread literary form of the Aramaic which Jesus himself had spoken. In this period, Syriac flowered, developed into a Christian language of unusual expressive power. It was both a language of religion and a language of commerce. As a result, by the year 600 and afterwards, Syriac speakers were dotted across all of Asia, from Antioch and Syria, across Iran and Central Asia, to the great Chinese western capital of Xianfu. And if you don't believe me, go to the Bun Internet Cultural Center, two stories down, I think, and you will see the great Shan Fu inscription, Chinese on the front, along the side, the steady letters of this Syriac inscription. That is a Middle Eastern language that had traveled very far. It is to this great third world that we must now turn. Its central axis was defined by the sweep of what we call the Fertile Crescent. The Fertile Crescent joined Mesopotamia to the Mediterranean in a greyish northern arc that stretched through what are now, alas, unhappy regions, from southern Iraq to Antioch and southward as far as the delta of the Nile. As far as Christian monasticism was concerned, the Fertile Crescent, and not the Roman territories of Greece and Europe, were where the action was. I'll be dealing with three main groups of monks and missionaries who moved up and down this Fertile Crescent at this time. The wandering Christian monks of Syria, the missionaries of the Manichees from Mesopotamia, and last but not least, the more sedentary but equally vocal monks of Egypt. Already in around the 270s, the Fertile Crescent was crisscrossed by extreme religious groups of Christian um, 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 origin. They expected to be supported entirely by the arms of those to whom they, to whom they mi mi ministered. They were a very striking lot. A letter that was written in the late third century to direct the behavior of one such group warned them that when they passed through pagan villages, they should not burst out into singing the psalms, which they usually did to hearten the local Christians, lest they be mistaken for a troop of traveling musicians. <laughs> Other charismatic wanderers came from yet further to the east, from central Mesopotamia. They were the messengers of a new prophet, the prophet Mani, who had died as a martyr at the hands of the Sasanian king of kings in 277. Though vehemently rejected by other Christians, Mani saw himself not as the enemy, but as the reformer of Christianity. He wished to be the St. Paul of his age. He sent his emissaries as apostles to establish his holy church in all regions of the earth, from the Roman Empire in the west to the Kushan kingdom of Central Asia in the east. He had the sweep of vision of a man who knew that in Mesopotamia he stood at the very crossroads of Asia. I quote, the Lord Zoroaster came to Persia. The Lord Buddha the wise came to the land of India. Jesus the Christ in the lands of the Romans came to the West and Mani would come to them all. 
Mahani's missionaries soon established themselves as the elect of his church. They ministered to local Manichaean communities called either catechumens or um, hearers. When they arrived in Syria and Egypt in around 300 AD, the Manichaean elect seemed less foreign to local Christians than we might think, for they modeled their behavior on exactly the same pattern of extreme poverty combined with ceaseless mo mobility, which the radical Christians of Syria of Mani's own time had also come to see as the distinctive mark of all true disciples of Jesus. In the words of the great Manichaean Coptic Psalm of the Wanderers discovered in Egypt, they went from village to village, they went into the roads hungry with no bread in their hands, they walked in the heat thirsting, they took no water to drink, no gold, no silver, no money did they take with them on their way. They went into the villages not knowing anybody. They were welcomed for his sake. They were loved for the Lord's name's sake. Yet these dramatic groups of wandering mendicant monks were soon met by an alternative version of the monastic life, primarily associated with Egypt. In the Fayum oasis, just south of the Nile Delta around Alexandria, in around 270, that is less than a decade before the death of, the, of Mani in 277, and well over a generation before the conversion of Constantine in 312, young Antony, a Coptic-speaking Egyptian and a comfortable farmer, the owner of an estate of some 200 acres, decided to move out of his v v v village. He had been converted by hearing in the village church the crucial message from the Gospel of St. Matthew. Just then it happened that the Gospel was being read and he heard the Lord saying to the rich young man, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in um, heaven. Matthew 19, 21. Now, we should note that the steps which Antony was represented as having taken at the time of his renunciation differed pointedly from the pattern established by his contemporaries, the holy wanderers of Syria and the missionaries of the Holy Church of the, of the Manichees. Antony did not take to the open roads. He took to the desert and he just stayed there. He became known as the first hermit, a heremitikos, from the Greek word, the herimos, desert. He was a man of, a, of the desert. He was not a wanderer of the open roads. His renunciation was also accompanied by a dramatic act of almsgiving to the real concrete poor. Selling all the rest of his portable wealth, his house furniture, silverware and clothes, when he had collected all the cash realized by this sale, he gave it to the poor. Furthermore, once he had divested himself of this wealth, he refused to receive alms for himself. Although established in the desert, Antony was believed to have maintained himself by the work of his own hands. His followers imitated him with studied intensity. The words of St. Paul at his most anxious to avoid the, ac the accusation of being himself a charismatic freeloader became the mantra of the monks of Egypt. For even when we were with you, we gave you this command, if anyone will not work, let him not eat. 2 Thessalonians 3.10 And so, by the time that Antony died, in 356, 
the debate between Syria and Egypt as to the correct form of monasticism, which had already rumbled for generations between Mesopotamia and the valley of the Nile, was brought out into the open. And what was the debate about? It was not only about who should receive alms from Christians, the real poor or the holy poor, wandering charismatics or indigent local beggars. It was swamped by a much larger issue. How was human society defined? by the obligation of all humans to work for a living. How many members of this society could claim to be called by a religious vocation to live without the patterns of work that characterize the lives of the majority of human beings? And last but not least, what claims, if any, did those who did not work have on the generation, on the generosity of lay persons who supported them through pious arms? Now these were truly basic questions. They brought to the surface in Christian form millennial arguments on the nature of man and society. Different regions and different Christian groups answered them in very different ways. Their different answers reveal markedly different attitudes to society as a whole. It is in the light of their differing attitudes to the meaning of work, therefore, that I'd like to interpret the various ascetic currents that flowed so vigorously between Mesopotamia, Syria, and Egypt in the late third and fourth centuries. Let us take the Manichees first. And with the Manichees, we begin with a stunning discovery. A little over a decade ago, a house was excavated in what had been known in ancient times as the village of Kelis in the Dakhle oasis of the western desert of Egypt. In it was found a complete cache of Manichaean works, including a set of personal letters from Manichaean elect to their many hearers. Now, Kelis lay over 600 miles to the south of the Fayum, but we now know that in around 340 AD, that is in exactly the same years as Antony was reaching the zenith of his fame in distant northern Egypt, the Lady Irene, Irene, a hearer, a catechumen, that is a lay disciple of the Manichaean elect, was being praised by the local elect in Kelis for putting her treasure in heaven in the manner distinctive to her sect. She was praised by the local elect for offering them material support. In so doing, they wrote, she was following the command of Christ in the Gospels but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where no moth or rust destroys, where thieves do not dig in and steal. Matthew 6, 19 to 20. And it then adds an explanation. Which treasures in heaven are, of course, the sun and the moon? Now, it's only this last telltale reference to the sun and the moon as active agents in a cosmic drama of salvation, which identified the writer of this letter as a manichae, rather than as a normal Christian. This newly exchange, this newly discovered exchange of Manichaean letters shows with the crispness of an X-ray photograph one path by which, in circles adjacent to mainline Christianity, treasure on earth might flow directly upwards to become treasure in um, heaven. 
the elect needed Irene and their fellow, her fellow catechumens. You being for us, they wrote, helpers and worthy patrons and firm, unbending pillars of the church. While we ourselves rely upon you, I was very grateful to you, ten million times, whether we are far from you or we are near. Indeed, we have found remembrance among you. Now, therefore, may it stay with you, this knowledge and this faith which you have known and believed in. Therefore, I beg you, my blessed daughters, that you will send me two large jars of oil, for you know yourselves that we are in need here, since we are afflicted. It is a very oily letter. <laughs> but what did Irene gain from this exchange? and what views of the world were implied in it. Among the Manichees, it was above all the nature of the material world itself which was at stake. It was their view of the material world as a whole, which gave a sharp flavor to their notion of almsgiving to the elect as members of the holy poor. For Manichees, the material universe was hopelessly corrupt. Matter was evil. The best that could be said of it was that it could be used in the words of a later Chinese catechism of the Manichaean faith as an immense distillation plant. It was like one of the magical laboratories in which alchemists had sought through a prolonged process of refinement to wrench from base matter in minute ethereal fragments the unalloyed essence of gold and of similar time-defying time substances, a sort of 100% spiritual moonshine. <laughs> <coughs> Irene's gifts were seen as a last, thin vestige of matter, painstakingly prized loose from an inherently evil world, sent on its way in the form of a solemn gift of food to the elect towards some final transmutation in the treasuries in the heights. Such wealth offered in this way, some have carried with it the very souls of its donors. These were the arms which Manichaean lay persons gave to their elect and to their elect only. For these were saving arms. They were offered to persons whose entire life had come to a stop. The elect were sealed sealed on their mouths, on their hands, on their genitals. They were sealed off thereby from process. They did not join themselves to fully living matter through unregulated eating. They did not contribute to the headlong pollulation of human flesh through intercourse and the begetting of children. And above all, they did not lend their hands to manual labor in the field with pale faces, soft white hands, the elect, men and women alike, for in this they were indistinguishable, had left the world. They already lived on the threshold of the mighty cessation, which would eventually fall upon the cosmos as a whole. They were what their lay supporters hoped that they themselves might yet become. Now, such a view had obviously palpable social implications. To cease to work for the Manichees was somehow to bring to a halt the demonic whir associated with the world of matter. This was how Mani himself was represented as a young man. 
he had greatly annoyed his fellow villagers by refusing to feed himself through tilling the ground, through plucking the vegetables in the lush gardens that surrounded their settlement in southern Mesopotamia. Indeed, he would stand outside the gardens, asking to receive his food as an act of almsgiving, as if he were a beggar. For the only relation to the world of which a chosen soul, such as his own, was capable, was of being as totally outside its sinister processes as a beggar was outside the normal processes of the the working um, 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 economy. Now, the Manichees were not alone in confronting the issue of the relation between work, food, and the human condition. Deep thought on the drudgery of labor, on ponos, the ponos of work, to use the highly charged Greek term, the um, amla, to use the Syriac. Ponos and amla were central to the radical tradition which became so prominent in Syria in the fourth, fifth, and even sixth centuries. The, this is perhaps not altogether surprising. As we saw, we're not dealing with a bankrupt region. Far from it. We are dealing with a thriving agrarian landscape, a true late antique Wirtschaftswunder. Syria was a zone of dense agrarian settlement. The same surge of population which in the fourth and fifth centuries had covered the highlands of Syria with villages of an unparalleled density also cast loose upon the roads an impressive number of charismatic wanderers who begged in villages who could afford to support them. Furthermore, we should always remember that this world had roots that reached deep into the past. The zones associated with Syria and Mesopotamia had produced the great Amit, 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 um, 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 Atrahasis, the Atrahasis myth in ancient Sumer in the second millennium BC. They had produced the opening chapters of the book of Genesis where Adam had been condemned by God to labor in the sweat of his brow. These great myths of the curse of labor in turn had spread across Asia Minor to influence the works and days of the Greek poet Hesiod. The careworn inhabitants of these regions of intensive agriculture had long wondered why it was that human beings had come, in the words of the great Sumerian Atrahasis, to bear the the drudgery, the dulum of the gods passed on to them by the toilless gods. Seen against a truly millennia-long background, the exegesis of the fall of Adam and Eve into toil, which became current in a vocal stream of Syriac Christianity, was only the last of a long series of sad ruminations by means of which the settled populations of the Fertile Crescent had attempted to make sense since at least the second millennium BC of the social trauma created by the agrarian revolution of the later Stone Age. Like all narratives of the loss of a golden age where human beings had once enjoyed freedom from toil, Radical Christian accounts of the fall of Adam and Eve presented human society as caught in the dull creek of Ponos, of drudgery. Unlike the Manichees, Syrian writers in this tradition did not believe that the entire material universe 
had been corrupted. But they did believe, and in no uncertain terms, that human society had fallen, and fallen deeply. Adam and Eve and their descendants had lost a first moment of sublime leisure. They had declined into the present careworn state of society by which human beings were dominated by the need to work so as to eat. Unlike the Augustinian tradition, with which we are better acquainted in the Latin West, the fall of Adam and Eve in this literature was not thought of as having brought about some profound inner weakening of the will, which was shown in its most subtle and enduring form in unregulated sexual desire. Rather, the true fall, the fall which blotted out all others in the imagination of many Syriac authors, had been a fall from the work-free abundance of Eden into the present world of toil. Work, dull work, not anything as interesting as sex, was the true curse of fallen humanity. Syrian Christians looked back poignantly to the days of Adam and Eve before the fall. This was the world they had lost. The Syriac author of the Liber Gradum, the Book of, of Degrees, explained in the early 5th century that before their fall, Adam and Eve had not known drudgery in Edom. Ra wrapped in contemplation, their labor had consisted only in the labor of angels, the Pulchana de Malake, the labor of angels. They were felachin, all right, they were workers, but they were workers in the spirit alone. Their backs had not been broken. Their hands had not been hardened by earthly toil. Their toil instead had been the weightless, ethereal toil of prayer, joining their voices with the angels in ceaseless praise of God, their bodies swaying gently but without violent effort as they bowed before him. Those who admired and supported the monks of Syria did so very much because they saw in these a touch of the long-lost angelic leisure of Adam come back to earth. Thus, throughout Syria and other eastern provinces, the spread of Manichaeism had coincided with a wave of wandering angelic monks who considered that they were fully entitled to support of the faithful because being freed from the shame of physical labor, they were engaged in the weightless labor of prayer on behalf of all persons. They lived in a symbiotic relationship with lay disciples in whose economic activities they shared in no way, but on whose generosity they depended entirely. Now, it's against the background of these presuppositions pre that we shall now place the answer offered by the monks of Egypt to the Christian piety which had prevailed in Syria and Mesopotamia and which threatened to make its way up the valley of the Nile. In the mid-fourth century, the Christian regions of the East as a whole, Egypt and Syria alike, were as it were poised between two great and evenly balanced alternatives, represented by two conflicting wings of the ascetic movement. One wing, as we have seen, claimed to have risen above labor, to be entitled to support through the arms of the laity. The other wing, of which we know much more, because it came to be more fully represented in the monastic traditions of Western Europe, projected an image by contrast of ferocious self-sufficiency, in which sedentary monks were expected to feed themselves by the work of their own hands. It was because of this wider issue, this wider debate, that manual work came to enjoy pride of place in Egyptian monastic folklore. 
precisely because it formed a counter image to Syrian practice. The issue of work in the self image of Egyptian monasticism was peculiarly charged, charged in a manner pointedly and diametrically opposite from that presented in the Syrian world. In the world of a words of a Coptic translation of what may well be the original version of Pelagius' Lausiac history, his account of the monks of Egypt, along with the conquest of the desert, the Pichob Nenejij, the work of the hands, was the glory of the men of Egypt. Why was this so? I would suggest that work was embraced because it summed up the stance of the true monk in Egypt to society and to the world around him. For work in Egypt was a denotator of the monk's abiding humanity. Unlike the ethereal Manichaean elect, and the angelic holy men of Syria who seem to float above the human condition because linked to society only by the thin ethereal thread of arms offered by the pious, the Egyptian monk put himself forward as a normal human being. And this was made plain for all to see in the most blunt manner possible. The monk was still linked to his fellows by the crude fact of work and by the need to sell the products of the labor of his hands and even on occasions of the labor of his own body as a seasonal harvester in the fields of local landowners in order to live. As a result, the illusions of work-free angels in the Syrian tradition were the stuff of humor in the hermitages of Egypt. There was to be no room in Egypt for angelic wannabes. <laughs> it was said of John the Dwarf that one day he said to his elder brother, I would like to be free of all care, like the angels who do not work, but ceaselessly offer worship to God. So he took off his cloak, went out into the desert. After a week, he came back to his brother. When he knocked on the door, he heard his brother say, Who are you? He said, I am John, your brother. But the brother replied, But John has become an angel. <laughs> Henceforth, he is no longer among men. His brother did not let him in, but left him there in distress until the morning. Then, opening the door, he said to him, You are a human being. You must work again in order to eat. Then John made a prostration before him and said, forgive me, and went back to his basket work. Thus, by around the year 400, half a century after the death of Antony of Egypt, a battle of the social imagination had been fought and won in at least one crucial region of the Christian world in Egypt. It was a battle about work which involved the manner in which Christian monasticism would fit into society. But to conclude, we should not overlook the wider implications of this battle. If we do so, I think it's because we tend to take the victory associated with the monks of Egypt rather for granted. We have become used to the image of the Egyptian monk of the industrious Egyptian monk, permanently settled in his monastery like a holy kibbutznik. It was this image which, of course, deeply influenced the rule of St. Benedict, which was drawn up for a monastery in southern Italy in the early 6th century. In later centuries, through the spread of the rule of Benedict, this version of monasticism became a model for the entire Christian West. We therefore assume that monasticism had always been like that. But this is not at all the case. If we look out at the great third world of Christianity in Africa and the Middle East, we find a very different social and religious landscape.
we need to appreciate again the power and the sheer geographical spread of the alternative model represented by the Manichees and by the angelic monks of Syria. For when seen against the spacious backdrop of Eurasia as a whole, the Manichees and the monks of Syria were the norm and the self-supporting communities of Egypt and the West were the odd men out. Looking at the world from Mesopotamia rather than from Rome, it is quite possible to imagine the emergence of a Christian monastic landscape that closely resembled the spread of the Sangha in Buddhist countries. Communities of ascetic virtuosi fed by their laity as part of an unceasing spiritual exchange by which matter in the form of food, shelter and clothing was offered in return for the ethereal spiritual goods of prayer and, and preaching. In following the fortunes of Christian asceticism across the fertile crescent, from Egypt to Syria, we have the privilege of listening in to one end of a debate on labor and monks that was as wide as Eurasia itself. The outcome of this debate ensured that parts of the Christian Middle East, notably Egypt and Western Europe, did not become what Eurasia east of the Pamirs, northern India, Central Asia, eventually Western China, became in precisely these centuries. At just this time, the great Chinese Buddhist pilgrim of the late 4th century, Fa Xian, walked all the way from China to India, following the route of the Buddha Sangha, along a chain of monasteries, each one totally supported by the arms of the laity, he called these regions lands of the begging bowl. Europe and Egypt and parts of Byzantium did not become what most of Eurasia did become. They did not become lands of the begging bowl. But nor should we underestimate the consequences of the victory in parts of Byzantine Christianity and in the Latin West, of the particularly imaginative model of society implied by an emphasis on the labor of the monks. Put in a, a nutshell, human society and human suffering associated with real divisions between rich and poor took on a density that was somehow lacking in the cosmic option of the Manichees and even in the angelic option of the Syrian wanderers. For both of these, Manichees and Syrians alike, human society somehow lacked substance. Dwarfed by the majesty of a fallen cosmos, as with the Manichees, or overshadowed by the great sadness of Adam's fall into a world of labor, as with the monks of Syria, the present day organization of society itself, its all too palpable divisions between rich and poor, represented no more than a thin sliver of the human condition. The division of rich and poor seemed insubstantial compared with the true stark division between the freedom of a spirit-filled few and the dull servitude to material things in which the majority of humanity, rich and poor alike, found itself caught. By claiming to live from the labor of their hands, the monks of Egypt asserted that they were not angels. Rather, they were fully paid up members of a human society characterized by sharp contours. They were linked by labor to the sufferings of that society. They were responsible for alleviating its all too real ills through real labor. They worked not only to support themselves, but to fulfill a social duty by giving alms. 
the monks of Egypt have all too easily been dismissed as by the majestic Edward Gibbon as no more than unhappy exiles from social life. But as we've seen, it's often those outside society who think most clearly about its ills and who bring its tensions most vividly to the surface in dramatic and arresting forms. This is what happened between Syria and Egypt in the fourth century. Through their insistence on the necessity of manual labor and on the duty of the monk not to be supported as the holy poor, but rather to work so as to support the real poor, the monks of Egypt brought a quite distinctive gritty flavor to the social imagination of their age. They contributed in their own way to an imagined victory which ever since that time has placed at the very heart of our modern conscience a model of society divided between the rich and the real poor in which the rich have a religious and moral duty to support the poor. So let me end in Egypt with the little known words of the great Coptic monastic prayer to the Archangel Michael. We find the intercession of Michael in the strenuous work of our hands, in the quietness of the oxen and in the growth of the lambs, in the body of the vine and in the gladness which is in the wine, in the fatness and the savor of the olives. And we find the intercession of Michael also when he is gentle towards those who are weary with toil and when he gives them strength. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Brown, for that. Uh, my name is Joshua Goner, and, and I, my question that I have is, uh, these, these monks that you describe in the Syriac tradition, um, of course, St. Benedict talks about gyrovagues at the beginning of his, uh, of his rule. Do you think that he might be thinking about something similar to these monks? Oh, yes, I mm -hmm. think so. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think one of our main problems is to get past uh, normative Western mm -hmm. ways of describing alternative forms of monasticism to do justice to their full, to their full di dimensions. Mm -hmm. Gyrovagues, remnuoth. Mm -hmm. You know, who knows what remnuoth is? I suspect nobody did, and that's why Jerome used the word. <laughs> um, so, I mean, you're dealing with movements that are constantly hiving off mm -hmm. what they consider to be their own l l l l loony left. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hello, my name is Patricia Richter, and in this whole idea of the real poor, is there very much in the literature about authors defining who they think the real poor are. You know, there's this the one wonderful monastic uh, story about, I don't remember which monk it is, but has this like freeloader who basically, you know, says, take me to town, sell your stuff, buy me this, buy me that, la la la. And at the end, of course, he's reviewed, he revealed to be an angel. Um, so is there much guidance between distinguishing, distinguishing between angels and freeloaders? Yes. No, I, I think you're, you're absolutely right. I think that 
don't forget, you see in this, this is in the apothegmata, it is apa agato, I think. It's the beginning of that very poignant notion. Not that Christ is in the poor generally, but one member of the poor, only one, may well be Christ or or an 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 angel. Don't forget in that apothegmata it is a cripple. That is, it's not a workless person, it's per somebody perf unable to work because of being crippled, which of course was always accepted as um, um, a good reason, which shows while in Talmud, any beggar who pretends to be crippled was sure to end up really crippled. <laughs> One can't be too careful. My name is Matt Music. Uh, my question is, what would happen for the Syrian wanderers in eras of prolonged economic downturn? Um, they would be out of a job, <laughs> I think. But that I don't think is necessarily what happened. I think there is something to be said for this, that one should always measure forms of monasticism in the late antique period by the ability of the surrounding laity to support them. That is, there's an economic history of monasticism that's not entirely internal to the monastic communities, and that is actually a good question. I think what happens is, and I may be wrong, um, that this was a very resilient economy that could well afford the sort of surplus. After all, wandering angels are very impressive, but they're basically very cheap. Um, um, on the other hand, as great land ownership does seem to get more and more established in Syria in particular, you see this in Egypt but at a slightly later period, the big landowners want monasteries. They want powerhouses of prayer. That is, they, they're no longer interested in the occasional fly-by-night, absolutely mag magnetic, charismatic, called in German a wander charismatica, and that's even more impressive than wandering charismatic. Um, um, and there I think you really do find a, a quieting down, but we really don't, it's impossible to tell from the archaeological surveys in the Jebel Saman, in this area, you can't tell whether the monks actually worked. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of evidence for productive activity in the big monasteries in Egypt, and it isn't purely t -t 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 token work. Big alfalfa hawsers and things like this, looms, all of this. In, in Syria, the, the, the jury is actually um, the, uh, um, out on that one. Syrian monasticism arrange, uh, arrives at a compromise, which is basically healthy young monks should work, but uh, learn, but you know, enlightened geezers like myself, uh, <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> Would that? Uh, Thank you. No, but I would urge, study the laity. Thank you, Professor Brown, for being here tonight and speaking with us. I'm most curious to know, what is your take on the acts of Judas Thomas in terms of wealth and almsgiving? Thank you. I've worried about it, and I have no clear answer. I'm terribly sorry. Um, my feeling about these documents, particularly the, with the Acts of Judas Thomas, we shouldn't let ourselves be unduly tempted to see them as archaic. That would be my only, conch, my only, um, my only caution. 
that these legendary accounts are legendary to us. They were not legendary to the people who read them. And they remained alive and well and influencing people's mindsets for centuries after. If you look at Byzantine stichometries, that is, the number of lines in a work, and compare those lines with the number of lines surviving in, say, modern ma manuscripts, medieval manuscripts, it's surprising how much what we might call apocryphal work just keeps on keeping on. It's part of the reality of this world. So that would be something I would constantly emphasize. Um, there is no doubt there that Thomas advises, um, it's more like the Book of Steps, the Book of Degrees. Thomas advises pious, rich persons to give to the poor, ke malista, but particularly to those who are living in a state of poverty and uh, celibacy. But thanks for reminding me. I should go back to it. David Goldfrank, Georgetown University. I want to know how three aspects of ancient East, Eastern Christian monasticism fit into the general picture you've been giving us. The first is the legend concerning Pahomius receiving the black garb from the angel, yes. the, the Egyptian, the Pahomius of, of Egypt. The second would be the advent of Euthymius and being followed then by Sabas and Theodosius in the Palestinian monasteries. And the third, the first Simeon, st the stylite, and the whole question of the pillar monks mm. in Syria. OK, that's, that is a big one. What we're actually talking about is change. Centuries are very long, even in late antiquity. <laughs> And I think there really is a, a notable difference between the world that produces what are the legends about Pacomius and the schema and the world of the Palestinian monasticism of um, the world of um, Cyril of Scythopolis, Sabas. So there, I'm afraid, let me, let me have allow me to have the historians cop out, things change. <laughs> what I think is interesting is the way they change, and they do change towards a much greater ritualization. They want a myth for the schema. They would rather it was actually John the Baptist's goat skin. That, I think, would be the real schema. So, you know, these are people in, uh, in an experiment searching for things that would give stability and above all would give imaginative st st stability. Would that answer? Very well. I mean, historians are awful. They always say, wait, wait for next century. But <laughs> in monasticism, I think it is a wise thing to do. <laughs> Good evening, Professor, Professor Brown. Uh, I want to tell you that your books have helped alleviate the drudgery of my legal labor the last 30 years, particularly uh, through the eye of a needle. And I think there's a very appropriate section in that book where you talk about how fluid Christianity was with different groups of people, maybe forming around a group of a, a holy noblewoman, or maybe other groups were religious communities, as you noted, non-Manichaean, of course. Do you see a similar situation arising with the church right now with our bishops worldwide? Even though the church is growing in, um, in Africa and Asia, do you see a possibility where we might be returning to that sort of a period? Because we appear to have bishops who've abdicated their evangelical function, and now we have a pontiff who more or less is retreating from doctrine. That's one question. The other question is, your book talked about the importance of women in the early church, and having just read Kate Cooper's superb book, 
band of angels. I cannot understand for the life of me why the bishops and members of uh, faculties teaching religious studies do not have that as required reading. And I just wanted to comment on a couple of those, please. Well, the great thing about being a historian is you're like Cassandra. You may give warnings, but nobody listens. <laughs> And you're very unwise to stand on tiptoe to give warnings. What I think is important is why do we study the distant past? We do it because I think it is distant from us and therefore we can handle some of its problems. I wouldn't say more objectively, but as you would look at the history of one's own family of, say, one's grandfather's time, so as to see, by seeing what happens, it does things to you. Hard to explain, it just does things to you. What I do see in late antique Christianity is a constant, constant debate, constant hiving off of small groups, constant chatter, and I think that if the Christians had not been so divided, Christianity might have gone under. It might have become like Buddhism in China, an interesting ritual alternative, but not really interesting. It's the sheer capacity for fighting each other that kept Christians going. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, And whether this is a formula for the modern age, <laughs> in the presence of so many potential or future bishops, it's not for me to tell. Hi, I'm Josh Mugler. I'm a student in theology here. Um, this is again looking a couple of centuries later, but uh, there's a hadith in Islam that's quoted very often, that, which is that there's no monasticism in Islam. And I'm wondering if you get a sense that there, it's, res, it's a response to either of these forms of monasticism or what, is, what, what might be driving that? Yeah, I, I'm not an, an Islamicist. I would love to be. <laughs> if I could have a brain transplant, it's the one I would opt for. And this is very important because we really cannot understand early Christianity without using Islam as a viable comparandum. It's not just a matter of influences, it's making you see things which you wouldn't usually see if you were simply concentrating on either Christian or Jewish texts. Once you read the Hadith literature, you realize there are so many echoes of your own world mysterious echoes, haunting echoes, that I would argue there's, there's very much room once again for studies on Christianity and Islamic asceticism. These studies are being, being done, one needn't worry. Um, I think the important thing is whenever, when, whenever somebody says of a religious movement that it isn't, the historian's rule is to suspect that a lot of people thought that it was. <laughs> and I think the anti-extreme Islamic, extreme ascetic Zucht, uh, abuses of Zucht becomes a real obsession to these lawyers in the 8th and 9th century. And one asks why. The reason is Zucht forms of supererogatory ascetic exercises are taken for granted by pious Muslims. Um, the other thing which, it, which I think is important, if you look at the image of Jesus in the Islamic tradition, who would dwell far from the villagers weeping, even of Plato in the Islamic tradition, who also dwelt far from the villagers weeping, <laughs> you're looking at a stylite monk. <laughs> you're looking at one of the angelic holy men of Syria. 
And that, I think, also is, to a certain degree, a measure of the importance of this Syriac tradition as the alternative to, to the Coptic Egyptian tradition. It truly permeates Islam. So that basic notions of sanctity, holiness, ascetic endeavor still have that, how to put it, that Christian flavor. You mustn't tell the learned men that, <laughs> because that they were convinced that, of course, Islam was, was a system that could f provide for its own riches and resources. But the historian can't help <laughs> observing. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Professor Brown, for a wonderful, wonderful talk. Please join us up in the Galleria, up the stairs, uh, for some wine, water, and um, cheese and crackers. Thank you.